Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome CHCI Microsoft Environmental Innovation Graduate Fellow, Amar Augustine Barwaj. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of the CHCI Leadership Conference. I hope you're having a good time. I hope you have enjoyed the lack of secret service security this morning. It's probably easier to get in. Uh, and I'm excited to, to be the MC for this morning. So my name is Amr Bardwaj. As mentioned, I'm a CHCI graduate fellow in the House Energy and Commerce Committee. And I'm pleased to start us out by introducing Marco Davis, who you all know well. Thank you, Amr. Buenos dias. Como estamos? Descansaron? Did you all get some rest last night? Been taking on the town? Welcome to day two of the 2022 CHCI Leadership Conference. Yesterday, we had the privilege of hearing from a dynamic lineup of elected officials, corporate executives, thought leaders, and community advocates. These experts and change makers engaged in thought-provoking dialogue on challenging but important issues, including addiction recovery, family separation, and achieving equitable justice outcomes for members of our community. And all that was fulfilling enough, but we also had the incredible opportunity of witnessing a profound conversation that CHCI's chairwoman, Congresswoman Nanette Diaz Barragan, had with Vice President Harris. We're still checking our records, but we think this may be the first time that our conference and gala has both the Vice President and the President here with us in person. Isn't that amazing? And I think that's a testament to the achievements and the progress of our community and the increasing importance, or more importantly, the increasing recognition of the importance of our community in the nation. So we're thrilled to begin this second day with more critical conversations that aim to inspire and ignite action. This year's theme, Rooted in Strength, Achieving Our Dreams, continues to guide our dialogues as we break down and assess the various societal factors that promote or inhibit Latino achievement. Today's lessons, today's lessons, <laughs> during today's sessions, panelists will tackle a number of timely issues, including the pressing need for, to support Latino educators, as well as how to protect them and our youth from gun violence in schools. The tragedy in Uvalde, Texas, earlier this year, devastated our nation in general and our Latino community in particular. And it provides yet another heartbreaking example of the dire need for steadfast investment in community safety, violence prevention measures, and collective justice. Those are the types of conversations we need to have and that we will have today. Our day two agenda will also include industry experts who will dive into the various pillars of health equity for Latinos including sustainable nutrition for families, rare disease detection, and the lasting effects of COVID-19 on individuals and communities. And I wanna encourage you all to join us in between the sessions during the breaks in the expo area, just across the hall in room 147, where we'll be airing the videos of our winning pitches from the third annual CHCI pitch competition all day. I wanna thank the sponsors of our pitch competition, which include Amgen, Amazon, Genentech, Constellation Brands, and State Farm. All of them have invested in supporting our pitch competition, which will allow us to award resources and invaluable support, including financial resources, to the winning pitches from the entrepreneurial, the nonprofit, and the young changemaker track, enabling more leaders to have even greater impact in their communities. So check it out in room 147 across the hall all throughout the day. And also, while I'm on the subject of room 147, if you happen to have the time at 2 p.m. during one of the breaks, join me across the hall in the expo area in room 147, where I'm gonna have a very special conversation with U.S. Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo, about the need for investment in economic opportunities for the Latino community to help the nation move forward. And then finally, we'll come back here to close out the day with a final plenary that speaks to the unique experiences of immigrants in our nation, the strength they demonstrate, and the dreams they pursue. And after that, we'll convene 
for our closing reception. I want to encourage you to make connections with the leaders and peers you find throughout the day, because these are the connections that will uplift and empower us to achieve our collective aspirations. With that, I invite you to enjoy our morning plenary that Amr is about to introduce. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Marco. So I'm excited to get us started with the morning session for today. This is going to be a new workforce navigating the energy transition uh, plenary session. Uh, in the climate work that I've done on and off the hill, I've seen that there can be a tendency for us to be kind of enamored with the, the shiny new technologies that we need to deploy to uh, address the energy transition. But I, I think it also will be important to think about the implications of these technology switches that we're going through. What's going to happen to the workers who rely on current uh, energy system uh, employment? What's going to who's going to be building the new energy technologies that we need in a clean energy future. And so I'm excited to have a really great panel here today to, to talk us through uh, some of these issues, uh, as well as uh, two members of Congress who are going to be joining us. So we'll have uh, session chairs, Rep. Ruben Gallego from Arizona and Rep. Vicente Gonzalez from Texas. Uh, it's my honor to start introducing uh, Rep. Ruben Gallego. He uh, represents Arizona's 7th Congressional District, including parts of Phoenix, Glendale, and Tolosan. He's a Marine Corps combat veteran who served in Iraq. Rep. Gallego was first elected to Congress in 2014. He's a member of the House Natural Resources Committee, the Subcommittee for Indigenous Peoples of the United States, the House Armed Services Committee, as well as the House Committee on Veterans Affairs. Congressman Ruben Gallego. Good morning, good morning. I heard some of you guys may have been out late last night. Um, I'm not here to scold you. I'm just here to give you some good lessons. Number one, pace yourself. You still have a lot more days. <laughs> thank you to Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. Thank you to Chairwoman Annette Badagan for putting an amazing uh, event together, as well, of course, as the staff who are amazing and always uh, have been. Uh, today, we're here to talk about the importance of Latino representation in the energy transition world. Latinos are 100% underrepresented in the clean energy workforce, as in just about every sector, a sector which is growing and growing strong. Latinos are also underrepresented in the industry's leadership positions. This panel of industry leaders will give valuable insight about how to advance the careers of Latino workers and promote upward mobility through these skilled positions. My own state of Arizona ranks fifth in the country for solar power electricity and second in solar energy potential. I'm extremely excited about some good, high paying, quality jobs that are gonna be coming to Arizona in this field. The Inflation Reduction Act included over 60 billion for clean energy manufacturing, tax credit for solar and wind production, and financing for energy infrastructure so the United States can expand its renewable production. Industry leaders have a chance to help strengthen this workforce pipeline too. They should support trade schools to train workers for solar industry jobs that may not require a college degree. College, as many know, is not affordable for many, but skilled workers can often attend trade schools and still be highly equipped for future jobs. Companies should also offer paid apprentices in the renewable energy space. If workers need on-the-job training, very few can afford to do it unpaid. We all know, we all have that family Whenever we told our parents, I'm gonna do an unpaid internship, they almost had a heart attack. Trust me, we, we, we have to do the same for the solar world. Finally, companies need to build diverse leadership teams. When Latinos are represented at the highest levels of industry, we can ensure that the workforce pipeline is strengthened with strong Latino representation. We shouldn't just be putting up the solar panels, we should also be owning the solar panel companies. Thanks again for having me. I look forward to continuing this conversation with you all in the future. Thank you, Congressman Gallego. Now it's my honor to introduce Representative Vicente Gonzalez. Rep. Gonzalez represents Texas's 15th Congressional di District, which encompasses the growing suburban counties of Brooks, Duval, Guadalupe, Jim Hogg, Garnes, and Live Oak, as well as portions of Hidalgo and Wilson counties. He was first elected to Congress in 2016. 
Rep. Vicente Gonzalez is on the Foreign Affairs Committee, where he serves on the subcommittees on Western Hemisphere, Civilian Security and Trade, and Europe, Eurasia, Energy, and the Environment. He also serves on the Financial Services Committee. Congressman Vicente Gonzalez. Buenos dias. How is everyone today? I hope well. Uh, good morning, and thank you, Amar, for this kind introduction. I'd also like to thank uh, CHCI for hosting this event. It's a pleasure to be here and to be part of this important discussion on how to navigate ongoing energy transitions. As many of you know, climate change is real, and it's here. It doesn't discriminate on who it affects. It affects all of us. But the reality is that it's an enormous and uh, it has an enormous and unequal impact on the livelihood of Latinos in this country. Over 50% of Latinos live in California, Texas, and Florida, states that have experienced extreme weather events fueled by climate change, from wildfires in California to historic floodings throughout the Midwest and South to major hurricanes in Texas and Florida. More than half of hired agriculture workers are Latino, as we all know, and more than 25% of construction workforce in this country is also Latino. Both sectors of the economy that are severely affected by extreme weather wrought by the increasing volatile climate. We have already seen considerable progress made in the transition of low carbon energy for the future technological advancements, consumer behaviors, and the significant decrease in cost to scale renewable energy from all major factors in this energy transition. From 2010 to 2019, we saw the cost of sol solar modules drop 77%, wind turbines fall 58%, and lithium batteries drop 87%. So clearly we're moving in the right direction. Additionally, we've seen a number of oil and gas companies set net zero emissions targets and make historic investments across the board from companies like Apple, Google, and Microsoft. With all of these factors, it is no surprise that the transition to clean, the clean energy economy is one of the fastest growing in our country. And with that, it's vastly important to include the Latino population in new opportunities that arise. As Congressman Gallego just said, we don't just want to put up the panels. We want to manufacture them. We want to own the business that delivers them, that puts them up. We want to own part of the industry, and it's our job to make this happen. And with that, it's vastly important to include Latino population in this new opportunity that arises. In Texas, Latinos actually account for almost 19% of the workforce in clean energy, compared to 16% nationwide. This is due to many factors, but it's clear that across the nation, we need more education, more job training, apprenticeships, programs, industry partnerships, and we need to effectively communicate to the Latino populations about the economic and educational opportunities that are available for them. However, it's also important that during this transition, we keep the cost of energy affordable for all. Rising energy costs hurt the marginalized disproportionately. So while we make this transition, it's important that we continue to offer reliable, affordable, and efficient energy. There are many pathways the country can go to achieve a successful transition. So I look forward to hearing the panel discussion this morning on the topic. Again, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I look forward to the conversation and look forward to meeting you all today sometime. Thank you so much. God bless you and God bless America. Thank you, Congressman Gonzalez. Now, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our sponsor speaker, Thomas Michaels. Tom uh, is the Director of Government Affairs for United Airlines. Uh, Tom joined United's Government Affairs team in 2018, where he covers both federal and state government affairs and leads all advocacy related to climate and sustainability issues. Please come out, Tom Michaels. Good morning. 
Wow, what an incredible honor to follow Congressman Gallego and Gonzalez here to the podium. Uh, my name is Tom Michaels, and I'm here today on behalf of United Airlines to kick off today's panel that focuses on nurturing and developing the workforce that will help the nation's energy economy transition toward a more sustainable future. United was the first airline to commit to going 100% green, aiming to reduce our emissions to zero by the year 2050, and to do so without relying on carbon offsets. To achieve this, we're making early stage investments into innovative technology that directly reduce or remove emissions. Some examples of these investments include companies like Fulcrum Bioenergy, who will transform municipal solid waste into high quality, low carbon jet fuel. Or Dimensional Energy, a new startup that will turn captured carbon dioxide into liquid jet fuel with renewable power. Decarbonizing our operations will be neither cheap nor easy, especially as we continue to grow and connect more people to more destinations across the globe. The critical building block to our growth plans are, of course, people. In the past 12 months, we hired 13,000 new employees, 7,000 of those hires in just the last six months. We are targeting at least 25,000 additional new hires by 2025. Now, we won't be able to hire that many skilled workers by simply drawing from the same places that we have historically. We need to tap new sources of talent among women and people of color. We need to break down the barriers to opportunity that have prevented many people from accessing these great careers. There are real upfront costs to becoming a pilot, for example, or an aviation mechanic that many simply cannot afford. We're alleviating those costs by launching new apprenticeships that allow people to earn while they learn. We even started our own flight training school, the United Aviate Academy in Goodyear, Arizona. Importantly, we have set a goal that at least half of our Aviate Academy graduates will be women or people of color. And we're backing that goal up with millions in scholarships funded in part by J.P. Morgan Chase and we're working with organizations like the Latino Pilots Association and others to identify scholarship candidates. That's a snapshot of how United is meeting this challenge. I look forward to hearing about other innovative solutions from our friends on this distinguished panel. Thank you all so much for having me today. Have a great day. Thank you, Tom. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for the panel discussion, Tanya Das. Tanya is the Associate Director of Energy Innovation at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Sorry for the mixed signals there, Tanya. She works to strengthen US government initiatives that help innovators go from idea to commercial product. She brings a decade of experience working in academia and government on clean energy, climate change, and industrial policy. She previously served the Biden administration as a chief of staff of the Office of Science at the US Department of Energy, and in Congress as a professional staff member on the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. Please welcome Dr. Tanya Das. Good morning. It's great to be here with you all today. Um, my name is Tanya Das. I am really pleased to be leading this really important conversation. Thank you to CHCI for hosting this thought-provoking conference and focusing attention on the critical issues of workforce development and clean energy. As we know, clean energy is poised to become one of the fastest growing sectors in the nation. Congress has been passing some really important bills lately, investing billions of dollars that are going to see huge amounts of technology growth and employment growth in this sector over the next decade. However, Latinos account for about 17% 17, 17 of the clean energy workforce currently. They are underrepresented at the forefront of this exciting energy tra uh, transition and do not typically hold leadership roles. So in this panel, we will be hearing from a uh, set of clean energy experts who will reflect on how this transition can create more job opportunities for Latino workers. I'm delighted to be joined by four experts on this topic. If you all would please join me on stage now and we'll get the conversation started. <clears throat> All 
right, welcome panelists. Um, first, I'm gonna do a quick round of introductions. <coughs> so first, please welcome Alex Nunez. Alex is the Senior Vice President of Governmental, Regulatory, and External Affairs for, for Baltimore Gas and Electric. Before joining this company in 2001, he worked for the Maryland General Assembly for sev several years where he served as committee counsel to the Senate Finance Committee of Maryland. Welcome, Alex. Thank you, good morning. Next, we have Yvonne McIntyre. Yvonne is the Vice President of Federal Affairs for PG&E Corporation, the parent company of the Pacific Gas and Electric Company. She is an electrical engineer with more than 30 years of experience in the energy sector. Prior to joining PG&E in 2021, Yvonne served as Director of Federal Electricity and Utility Policy for the Natural, Natural Resources Defense Council, overseeing issues related to national energy policy, electricity markets, natural gas, climate change, the Clean Air Act, renewable energy technologies, and tax incentives. So a wealth of knowledge. Thanks for joining <laughs> us. Next, we have Amy Travaiso loving Amy is Senior Director of Federal Relations for the American Petroleum Institute, which represents all segments of America's natural gas and oil industry, providing more than 10 million US jobs. Amy has years of bipartisan experience and insight from her time on Capitol Hill, in political campaigns, and in the private sector. Welcome, Amy. And lastly, we have Dr. Andrea Marpilero Colomina. Andrea is the Sustainable Communities Program Director at Green Latinos, where she advocates for policymaking to create a just and environmentally sustainable future for our communities. Her passion is making, uh, making places function and feel better for the people who inhabit them while advancing equity, supporting anti-racist practices, honoring history, and creating healthy and beautiful public space. Thank you so much for joining us. To all of you in the audience, please feel free to tweet your comments about this session at hashtag CHCIHHM22. And now we'll get started with the conversation. So first, let's, let's start with the basics. What are some of the barriers to Latino employees working in the energy field today? And for all of you, as a group of Latino and Latina energy professionals, are there any personal stories you feel comfortable sharing with our audience today on this topic? Would you like me to start? Sure. Okay. You look like you've got something to say. Uh, well, first of all, good morning to everybody, and thanks for including me and including Exelon, my parent company, in the conversation. It's kind of great time with uh, tomorrow being the kickoff for Hispanic Heritage Month that we're celebrating some of what we've done and talking about what more we can do. So uh, it's great to see the great uh, turnout today. I think about barriers, uh, you can look at them a couple different ways. The way I, I tend to look at it is what is being done to create the barrier and what can we do to wear that down or remove it entirely. And my perspective is that the energy industry today is really evolved from what we know as the utility industry. And my company is a company of utilities that deliver electricity and gas. That industry has not been traditionally diverse. It's very white. And over decades, and in some cases, centuries, these companies have organically grown their workforce by who they knew at the company, who, <coughs> who was neighbors of who, who might be relatives. And the people who came to the company were people who could see themselves there, who could see themselves being supported and successful. And the community around the companies has changed dramatically, and there's a lot of work to be done. The barrier is being created, I think, by a lack of intentionality by the energy sector in really making itself not just available to, but supportive, welcoming, and urgently asking uh, more diverse populations, including the Latino population, to join it. So to me, it's about a lack of intentionality uh, that creates a barrier, we need to reverse that. How, hopefully we can talk about that at the next question. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, again, thank you for having me here today and I'm proud to be here representing Pacific Gas and Electric. Um, and I will <clears throat> come at it from a personal story. Um, I am an engineer um, and very often, uh, I was the only uh, person of color at going through engineering school and I was always the last person picked um, in my lab classes. And you know that, that type of just being overlooked 
um, passed over has just been a constant throughout my career. Um, and fortunately for me, I had good role models. My father was an electrical engineer as well. Um, my mother was accomplished. Um, and so even though I faced a lot of these barriers, um, you know, I was pushed and I, could, I saw that I could achieve. I could make it in this world. Um, but it's it not been easy, you know, going into the corporate world um, many times. You know, I'm, I'm, again, the only person of color at the table. And I say something, nobody pays attention to me. You know, the white man says the same thing. Oh, great idea. And they run with the ideas that, you know, came out of my mouth. Um, but I always stood up for myself. I always had supporters who really promoted me, pushed me, recognized what I was doing, what I was saying, and um, helped me achieve what I have, you know, throughout my career. And so I think the barriers are, you know, we don't see as many role models um, in, in, in the energy world, um, don't have the support, always have, you know, people in the past saying, you can't do it. And people take that in and they don't move forward. And so I think what we need are, is more visibility, more role models, more support, but also just, you know, the internal strength to overcome those barriers to achieve. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Happy to be here. Um, and on behalf of American Petroleum Institute, we represent, um, you know, I'm here speaking on behalf of all the companies that we represent in the oil and natural gas industry. And I echo uh, my colleagues' sentiments here that I think having role models and people that look like you is important. Um, the oil and natural gas industry and the energy industry as a whole is not one that people typically hear of or gravitate to unless you happen to be exposed to that industry um, through regional or, or personal contacts. I grew up in South Texas, and for me personally, there was an Eagle Ford shale boom. There was a revolution of you know, new energy being created in South Texas. Prior to that movement, I didn't know anyone who worked in the energy industry. It's something you hear from a distance. It's something that men are, are in, not something that women gravitate to. So really seeing role models is important. Um, for the companies that I work for and that I represent, we recognize that there's a wide range of talent and education that is needed for the energy sector. There's very high specialized uh, professions, engineering, scientists, geo, um, geothermal you know, specialists, and that is, is a pathway and an educational uh, process and pathway that's hard to reach and achieve if you are not exposed to STEM education, if your community doesn't teach STEM education um, in your you know, K through 12 education. Um, and our industry is trying very hard to recognize where that gap exists and going into communities that may not have strong um, Hispanic, African-American representation, leaders, thought leaders, educators, professors, and investing for those that want to get pulled into the STEM education. And if you want to pursue a higher education through that field, there are opportunities, there's mentorships, and there's scholarships, but also recognizing that there's good paying jobs in this industry, as Congressman Gallego mentioned this morning, that are not necessary to have a four-year college degree. Um, and those training programs need to make sure that they're not just available, but they're available in multiple languages, that they're available for everyone to learn and read the manuals and be trained and taught in whatever language you are fluent and naturally speaking in. And I think that's something that needs to be addressed as we are promoting things like STEM education and skills development, that it's great to have the curriculum, but how are we making sure that it's actually understood and reachable to all of us who come from very diverse backgrounds. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here on behalf of Green Latinos. Um, I agree with everything that's been said, and I think really what we're talking about here are multiple layers of systemic barriers to entry. And I think it really starts in just breaking down what a clean energy job is, right? Which like most people don't know, don't even know what an energy job is, right? You sort of you know, people are like, oh, is that like mean working for the utility? I hate my utility. My bills are high. Um, what do you? What kind of degree do you have to get to work in clean energy? Where do I get that degree? What does that look like? Um, and I think um, everybody else has sort of touched on this in in great depth. But I think 
we've really got to work hard um, to, to make clean energy jobs and the clean energy industry um, accessible to Latinos, accessible to um, historically uh, overlooked and marginalized groups, folk, you know, women, people of color, people that have not had their voices heard in the rooms because of their gender or what they look like or what their first language is or whatever. Um, all of those pieces need to be sort of working in tandem, starting with you know, K through 12 education to community college, to four-year college, to technical to degrees, to the kinds of recreational activities that are offered through libraries or other, um, you know, state or municipal-led um, programs for children and youth and young people. All of that really needs to come together. And, and only then can we really um, think about systemically and systematically breaking down some of those barriers and, and looking at a clean jobs future, a clean energy jobs future um, that will be equitable. Thank you. Those comments are all really thoughtful. And you know, I, I really love where, where we ended with pointing out the fact that this is really a systemic issue, but that covers all education levels. It really starts at the beginning from when, when folks at the K through 12 level, but also, <coughs> also beyond. Um, you know, this is, starting with the basics is really important, but as we know, representation um, at, at the leadership level is even worse for Latinos. It wasn't until 2017 that we had the first Latina CEO of a Fortune 500 company with Geisha Williams as the CEO of PG&E. Um, so would love to hear from you, what are the strategies for addressing underrepresentation at the leadership level in the energy sector, which I think is a bit of a, a, different, um, a different quality? Do you want to mix it up, or you want me to go? Go for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, this is this is a great question. Uh, it, it is so important to see, as if we've already heard, you have to be able to see yourself in a group to want to join it, and that includes and really probably is most important at leadership because that's what you want to people to aspire to. At Exelon, we recently established uh, what we call our Latinx Leadership Council. And it was, it was founded by a couple of us, uh, executive Latinos, who looked around and didn't see too many more of us uh, than we were gathered around a table for dinner one night. And we thought on what could we do and what could the data tell us uh, about our options. And so we started by confirming what we knew, that we were severely underrepresented generally in the population of the workforce, uh, but also in, in ranks of senior leadership. So we took about 18 months to forge a curriculum, a process, and, and a program that we call ARDA, which stands for Attract, Retain, Develop, and Advance. And it has got one mission, and that is to increase the number of Latinos in leadership at Exelon. Uh, we launched that program this year. There were six people who were selected who were mid to upper level management, high potential, but just below the executive ranks. And we worked with Columbia University, Johns Hopkins University, a number of external uh, resources and internal resources, our HR department, our talent management uh, organization, our DEI leadership team, to, to really shape a year-long program to accelerate their readiness. So the next VP job that comes up, I would expect each of this cohort to be on the slate. Uh, we, we noted specifically that we were very light in Latina leadership, and so we were over, over uh, focusing, so to speak, on the Latina population for this first cohort. The next thing we did was, and I'll, if you can go, give me one more second, we, we took the next step and said, well, when, when these folks are all executives, who comes after them? And we also launched a program we call Latinx Development, Developing Leaders Program. And these are folks who are individual contributors. They're not leading teams today, but we know they have the potential based on their work product. These are all, again, high-performing individuals. We have launched a, a seven-month program, I think it's seven months, uh, to accelerate their readiness to take on that first significant leadership position. In a handful of years, we're hoping they're in that next program. And then the, the, the element that we're, we're yet to launch, that'll be in 2023, is a talent acquisition 
uh, component, which is where we really r redo how we find talent in the community. And I uh, hope if you'll have me back next year, I can tell you a little bit about how that's proceeding. But we're, we're taking a, a full look, creating a bit of an <coughs> ecosystem around this and leveraging programs that we also have in place that are similar for the Pan-Asian and African-American populations. Well, thank you for mentioning Geisha Williams. PG&E was very proud and excited to promote her to the CEO. Um, and you know, she, she led our company during some very difficult times um, and, and she led very successfully. Um, but she's a great example of you know, looking within, promoting from within. She had held several other leadership uh, positions in the company. Um, and so that is what you know, we look to do. Our current CEO, Patty Poppy, is very committed to diversity, equity, and inclu inclusion. Um, you see that, that she's embracing that culture by the very diverse leadership team that she's assembled and brought on board. Um, and, and we'll continue to look for those opportunities of you know, highlighting, searching for the next generation of leaders, diverse leaders within the company, um, and developing them, raising them up. Um, and as Exxon is doing, you know, in, in our hiring practices, we are also looking for and ensuring that as we look for new talent, that you know, there, there is this conscious effort to attract a diverse um, uh, employee base and that, again, we can then learn to build and, and drive up into the company. Um, on behalf of API and our member companies, you know, typically, when you enter into the energy industry, it does become a lifelong career. It's a specialized segment um, of America's energy industry and, and, and globally. And so typically people come into this industry and they make lifelong careers and they evolve and they grow. Um, the industry is very committed in investing, as we mentioned earlier, in K through 12, in skills ready programs, in partnering throughout the United States, working with minority serving institutions to bring in new talent, to acquire and to attract Hispanics into our segment of the industry. But we do realize there are gaps. There are generations where you know, the Hispanic community was not attracted or interested in pursuing energy careers. And so we're trying to, to catch up for what the boardroom looks like 50 years ago, 20 years ago, and even right now. Um, one of the things that our companies are doing and, and API is really proud to do is continue to engage and work with our congressional leaders. Um, you know, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus has been such a leader in bringing in not only the energy industry, but bringing in all industries and making sure that they are working with us, asking us questions. We are working with them, getting feedback on how we can be better, what we can be doing more, um, and, and learning from not just our, our partners in the energy industry, but others, um, and share information. API had a wonderful opportunity to meet with congressional leaders uh, last year, and we sat down and talked about our best practices, how we can elevate Hispanics, African Americans, people of color upward once they're in our industry. How do we get them to the boardroom? How do we get them to the C-suite? Also, how do we educate and partner with our minority-owned businesses? We recognize that we're a very technical industry, as I, I kind of continue to say that, um, and we want to hire more lawyers. We want to hire more accountants that are minority-owned businesses, and that how can we partner, and we're doing a lot of in the supplier diversity space. API has put years of work into this, and a lot of our member companies, one of our biggest member companies is celebrating 50 years this year of investment in supplier diversity. And those are ways that we can bring in new talent and they can hold us accountable. But I really appreciate our congressional leaders like Congressman Gallego and Congressman Gonzalez who are continuing to teach us how we can be better and we can learn from them. Um, to put it bluntly, I think that the lack of leadership um, that we see from Latinos and other people of color um, at the top of the energy industry is like more of the same shit, right? It's the same systemic barriers that are preventing people from entering the field. Those people who make it past that initial barrier then are facing micro and macro aggressions. 
They're being passed over for promotions. They're not being heard at the table. And so again, not to be like beating the dead horse here, right? We've got to really think about as we're in this beautiful pivotal moment, right? Just imbue some optimism here, that where we're transforming the, the energy industry, where there's millions and millions and millions of dollars being put into a clean energy future, how can some of that money and how can some of that intention be really explicitly focused on elevating the achievements of Latino, Black, other people of color, women, uh, first generation, non-native English speakers, elevating them and, and making seats at the table for those folks to really participate in the transition because the beauty of that also is that they are often bringing knowledge that the sort of traditional C-suite occupants don't have. Um, and so there really needs to be a way that space is created for those people to be there, for that leadership to not only exist, but be supported and grow. And, 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 and to some of the things that other folks said in response to this question, right? Who's behind those people? And how are we creating layers of leadership, um, you know, sort of waiting in the wings that we know will make it possible to have a long-term um, equitable, just, racially and culturally diverse um, clean energy future? Thank you. And one thing you mentioned earlier in this conversation, Andrea, was the fact that many folks may not even be aware of energy jobs. You know, we've heard that these are good paying jobs, they are opportunities for a lifelong career, but with so many pressing issues facing the Latino community, energy and climate change may not always rise to the top of the list for the younger generation to consider pursuing a career in. So my next question to you all is how we can create more awareness of an interest in working in the energy sector for younger Latinos who will be joining the workforce over the next decade. And maybe I'll start with you, Andrea. We can go the opposite order. Great. Yeah, I think it's a really important question. And I, and I want to start by also just saying, um, actually, Latinos are shown to be repeatedly the group that is most concerned about climate change across ages. Um, I participated in a survey with um, We Act for Environmental Justice at the beginning of the year, and I can't remember what the exact percentage is, but it's something like 80% of Latinos feel that climate change has already directly impacted their communities, and 65% um, are deeply motivated to do something about it and believe that it should be a priority for politicians. So the interest is certainly there. And that shouldn't be surprising because uh, Latino communities are disproportionately impacted by pollu pollution, um, transportation emissions, dirty energy production in their communities. And I, and I think it, that's a real opportunity, right? Like, let's harness the fact that people are like, I literally grew up next to an oil refinery, next to a highway, you know, down the street from a major transportation facility or a garbage incinerator. I know. Right, I have asthma. My brother has asthma. My mother has heart disease. Whatever you know, the horrible conditions may be, and they don't have to exist. Right, I'm not saying like that's a prerequisite, but but that's the lived reality of many people, and they have deep understanding of what that looks like and how urgent it is to transform, um, you know, the energy economy and the energy sector to so that we can literally breathe the air in the communities where we live. I think the Latino voice, the Latina voice is so strong and, and just the advances and how we communicate these days is, is different than how I had it, you know, accessibility to jobs, opportunities, or even to, to vocalize an issue that may have impacted my daily life or impacted my family. And so I think continuing to educate, um, to ask questions, to, to use your voice and hold everyone accountable of how climate change is affecting you, how industries are making investments in their specific industry. We are, as you know, API, we're happy to highlight the investments that are being made to achieve emission reductions to a cleaner, renewable future. But we want to hear from all of you how we can be better at that. And I think until we try and, can, and open up a 
dialogue, get into communities, but using your voice, making sure we hear you. Someone told me, you know, and it was really impactful that listening and hearing, right? We can talk, but we need to hear. And we need to make sure that we're hearing from the right people. And you are the right people. Our community is the right people. And we need to hear your voice. So I would just, you know, kind of call to action, continue to let us know um, how your life is being impacted by the effects of climate change. And I, I think it, it also goes to visibility. I mean, you know, people need to see, you know, what what is available, what what types of jobs are are in um, energy sector, and see the role models and people out there. Um, you know, PG&E Service Territory has a large Hispanic population, and so just being involved in the community, um, we we do a lot of corporate and, and fa uh, charitable giving. You know, we have scholarships for. Um, you know, high school, high-performing high school students. We um, target K through 12 education um, through different uh, programs that we have where, you know, we, we bring the students in, we show them, you know, the types of jobs that, you know, get, get them an introduction to science and, and STEM fields. Um, we do workforce training. Um, we do internships for with high school students. So, you know, bringing, starting from, you know, the, the lower elementary levels all the way up, just to give them an intro, introduction to what is available in the field um, and getting them started down that path of having an interest in going into the energy sector. Well, I think you've already heard some good ideas. I'll, I'll kind of build on where I think Yvonne was. And, and I think it goes back to where I was, my, the response to my first question, it's about intentionality. This isn't a program. This isn't an initiative. If we're actually going to drive awareness, which is what the question was asking about, we need to embrace the community uh, and, and really create an ecosystem of support. So I agree. It's about where are you showing up where the Latinos are? Are you, are you supporting the nonprofits that are serving them? Are you embracing the youth? Are you uh, bringing them in for internships? Are you creating capacity in the, in the contractor community for minority-owned businesses? And you end up sending a message that isn't a marketing campaign and a Spanish language advertisement for a job. Instead, you say, we actually want you. We really want to bring you in because we have created a workspace that is not only going to welcome you, it's going to support you, it is going to help you develop, it is going to help you thrive. And you can't do that without creating an ecosystem of support. So I think that's the approach we take, and I think it's what we need to do as an industry. Thank you all so much. I, I love what you said right now, Alex, that it's not an initiative, right? It's not just this one-off box checking exercise. It's really something that requires systemic change over a sustained period of time. That's really gonna get us where we need to be. And investment. Yes. Where the exactly. dollars go makes a difference and people yep. notice that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, now we're gonna move to questions from the audience. So um, would love to invite any of you to pose some questions to our, our panel here. Hello. Uh, good morning, Natalie Manjarez. Uh, I love, and my first job is to bring more Latinos into STEM. Uh, and because of that, I, I want to ask you, how many of you have actually looked at how your C-suite and your board of directors look when it comes to diversity? Because I have found that most of my candidates, the first thing that they ask me is, how high can I go in this company? How does your board and your C-suite look so that I can see how far I can go? It's a great question. Um, I'll say, I mean, I think PG&E's got a really great example of uh, having had a CEO that was diverse. We, we've had uh, a number of leaders throughout Exelon. I'll focus at BGE for a moment, both on the board and in our executive leadership team that are diverse. and it's. I'm very proud to say we've got three Latinos uh, out of an executive leadership team of about 15. I think that's pretty good. 
Uh, but it's also true that we have a, a number of women, African Americans, Asian Americans. We have we have looked at diversity through you know a comprehensive approach, and we we think about a person's background and experience. We also look at how they champion the core value of diversity, equity, inclusion in their leadership. So we want to not only select leaders who represent. We also want to select leaders who are invested in that core value and who are going to help make decisions and prioritize actions that are going to actually advance equity in the community. So I think your point's right. And we, we do think both board and executive leadership is critical. And, and that's the program I was referring to earlier to drive more readiness to take those VP roles when they become available. All right. We'll move to our next question then. Good morning, Chris Wilkie, CEO of SHIP. And I'm curious, we've heard a lot throughout the conversation about recruitment specifically preparing to engage incoming workforce. Um, but in a lot of my conversations with corporate execs right now, the conversation is shifting off of recruitment and much more on retention. And so I'm wondering if the panel could spend a few minutes talking about some of the trends and some of the experiences that you're seeing in the industry when it comes to retaining the diverse talent that you're, you're finding and you're hiring. I'm happy to answer. Hi, Chris. <laughs> Hi. Um, no, that is a challenge. I think within kind of the oil and natural gas industry, there's also a lot of competition, I think, just within company to companies. And people are moving to different companies that they find are more innovative or leading in different um, areas. All of our companies are putting priorities into a cleaner energy future. And so some companies are leading in one space, another company may be leading in a, in, in a different. Um, and talent is switching and moving around based on what area of the cleaner pathway they're moving to. Um, we are hearing a lot about, you know, retention is very important and we're trying to work with partners like SHIP um, to continue to maintain and educate and bring the workforce in. We're also hoping to continue to recruit because folks, when they do come into the industry, um, they stay, they, they enjoy this segment. Um, we're partnering with um, organizations. We just rolled out this Skills Ready, that is API uh, program and, and its initiative that's going to be become lifelong. And we're par partnering with groups like Opportunity at Work in different communities, bringing folks in and really making sure that compensation, opportunities, and kind of a diverse portfolio are, are keeping our employees interested in the energy segment. I I'll say for the utility sector, um, which I have been in for you know, 30, 30 years, um, we typically don't have that issue, as mm -hmm. Amy said. And like, you work for a power company, you're usually there kind of lifelong, long position. Although there are certain positions that we do have uh, problems retaining. Um, and, and they're more of the kind of on the ground technical linemen um, you know, type, type positions um, that they're just not enough people going into that, those, um, those types of careers, those types of jobs. And so it is, you know, apprenticeship training. Um, and, and right now, just because of the way our economy is, you, you lose a lot of those people to the construction business because they can make more money there. Um, the other thing is, you know, we're, we're, we're in Northern California, we're in the San Francisco area. And so trying to keep the more kind of computer type, you know, tech, techie type uh, positions it's very hard to compete with the big tech companies. And so, you know, we are trying to find ways to, you know, attract the talent, retain that talent, um, but, but it's difficult just, again, from where, where we stand in the country. Yeah, I think, you've, Chris, you've heard some, first of all, your organization's a great partner to the industry. I appreciate that to, to start that. I think um, in some ways, how we retain Latinos should be how we retain all of the employees, right? And that's creating a workplace that treats everyone fairly, that gives everyone fair opportunity for advancement, and that uh, is clear about its mission. Because I think increasingly employees are looking for alignment between their own values and the values and mission of the people who they spend a bulk of their, their waking hours working for. Um, but for the Latino population, I think the other thing is, is the commitment real? 
I mean, I think you can tell whether it's superficial. You can tell whether it's a, you know, a celebratory day and you, you have some good food and fun and then you move on and everything goes back to normal. Or do you have an employee resource group that is actively educating, actively working to leverage the voice of the Latino presence and to gain allyship from the non-Latinos in the community, in the workplace community? So I think it's about being a real credible uh, host for the Latino voice and to, to ensure alignment with the mission. Next question. Hola, uh, Blanca Torres from Hispanas Organized for Political Equality. Um, we've talked a lot about awareness um, and getting people to even believe climate change is real. How do I go about, you know, as a gen gen younger generation, um, getting to navigate, um, kind of changing the narrative and getting my parents to even listen. The older generation, you know, especially as Latinos are very grounded and rooted in their beliefs and a lot of time they don't even want to hear it. So how do I just go about navigating that space? I can answer that, I think. <laughs> well, I can't answer that, but I can. <laughs> it's an unanswerable question, but it's a great <laughs> question. Um, and, and I think, you know, I think there is a lot of, I think, all young people today have are facing this horrific burden of having to live their life on a planet that has been essentially destroyed by the people that came before them. And, um, and, and many of those people don't really feel responsible or like they don't care or whatever, you know, or capitalism drove the decisions they made. And I think as a, as a young person, it's a really tough burden, um, but I do think that what you can what you can do right is is show how um, the effects of climate change are hurting our communities. And sometimes you don't really have to show much; it's right there. But sort of explaining those connections right between um, a polluting an industry and the fact that you know, a child is sick or somebody loses their breath running for the bus or, you know, more than usual um, or whatever. Um, and also really showing again, right, the, the thing that many people already know, unfortunately, which is that many of the effects that we live with from climate change every single day are a, a, um, a consequence of historic and present day racist policy practices. Um, systemic decisions that have put more marginalized groups in more vulnerable positions. And then it's up to us to fight back against that, right? And whether you be, you know, 10, 20, 90, right? We all have a, a really, really valuable um, voice to contribute to the table. We all have our experiences and our knowledge that we can um, bring with us. And, and those voices, which are in this room, right, can, can, can play a really, really pivotal role in transforming the conversation and then transforming the sector itself, right? Through jobs, through the way that those opportunities become available, through the decisions that um, energy companies are making in the communities where they have um, presence, whether that presence be you know, more positive or negative. Um, I. I I think that just showing that you can make a difference, right? Uh, I have a 22-year-old daughter um, who, you know, for a long time was gloom and doom. Oh my God, you know, you work in this industry that's polluting, and you're a terrible person, and all of you. Know. Um, but she has seen that, you know, there, there, it, it is possible to make a change. And you know, she's now working in public affairs. She works, you know, a lot, a lot of clean tech and clean energy clients um, and, and she's moving the needle. And, you know, it's frustrating because the pace of change often is very slow, particularly at the federal level. But you see just in the past month, you know, we had this tremendous, you know, um, climate change investment bill that passed that, you know, moved fairly quickly, you know, from the time it was introduced. And again, you may see that just in, as incremental, but that was tremendous and it's really going to move the needle. Um, you know, transitioning us to a clean energy economy. And just, again, a lot of people had something to do with that. Um, and, you know, it, it is possible to make a change. Um, it is possible to be involved, make a difference, and, you know, just 
you have to not want things to be immediate because it's not going to be immediate. But you know, we're, we're moving there. We're moving the needle. And everyone can have a role in doing that. Thank you. So I think all that to say, we're really grateful for your work. Um, unfortunately, I think that was the last question we had time for. Um, so maybe the folks who still have questions can track down our panelists uh, later in the day. Um, but now I'd love to invite just some closing comments from our panelists. Um, as a prompt, if you want to share something like a success story that you've come across on how to improve representation of the Latino community in the energy, uh, in our nation's energy workforce, or any other thoughts reflecting on our conversation today. Go ahead. Okay, everybody looks at me. Um, I think I'll pick one from uh, the program that I described earlier, the, the ARDA program, which is the Executive Readiness Acceleration Program. Um, the success story isn't that we have one of those people in a VP slot. I do think that's going to happen soon. But it was the, the people who actually did the work, the, the project managers who did the work to create the curriculum, to figure out all the logistics. Um, they are, they, one of them came to me so grateful for the opportunity and she had just found out that she's going to be in the next year's class for the Latinx Developing Leaders Program, the other one for the person wanting to take that first leadership role. And I, I think it's just a personal, um, Valid validation that the investment we make in people will come back. And this person was willing to invest, but I can now see she's going to lead. She wants to be a leader. She's going to be sh creating the shadow that other people will model their own behavior after. And so I think that's a success because I know it's a, it's a near-term one for her to be in next year's program, but the long-term success that you can foresee that's, that's what keeps me really focused on this work. Thanks. I think internally, um, you know, we're, we're very proud of our employee resource groups, um, our engineering network groups that, you know, are very much promoted and, and um, within the company to provide a voice for, you know, varying interest and in, in varying communities within the company. Um, so, you know, for the start of Hispanic Heritage Month, um, we do have um, programs that our Hispanic um, Employee Resource Group and, and the Engineer Networking Groups are, are putting on. Um, you know, we have, um, we do have a board member, a Hispanic board member, um, Carlos Hernandez, and so he is going to be a presenter at, at one, of the, um, one of the events uh, talking about his, his path to um, where, where he ended up in the leadership role, the CEO wrote at Floor Corporation. Um, and there's, there's a number of other um, events that we're gonna be doing over, over the Hispanic Heritage Month that again, you know, highlighting just the community, the Hispanic community within our company, um, letting people know that they're there, helping promote those, um, those employees uh, and, and getting them noticed within the company. And so, you know, I think, you know, PG&E, um, I've only been there since January. Um, I'm seeing some good things that they're doing. I think we are looking even more towards what more we can be doing to develop, promote, and, and lift up our, our Latino employees. Same. I'm really proud of the companies um, that I represent, their investments and their commitments and their long-term commitments to various programs like the one I've mentioned before, um, Skills Ready, which is an API association-led industry, which is acquiring young talent, training, creating opportunities um, through minority-serving institutions and scholarship opportunities so you can be trained if, if that's the path you want to pursue. The commitments that are being made in supplier diversity, working with third parties, um, making sure that we are connecting and entering into communities that maybe our companies don't know that they need to be in and making sure it's shining a light on, on businesses, areas that want to work with the industry and making sure that we're, we're working um, to connect those dots. Many of our partners are here in this room and I, I can see you and, and we thank you for that, for working with us. Um, and also just making sure, you know, that we are continuing to create opportunities as the job, the energy sector jobs look different over the years. 
there is going to be new jobs that don't exist right now, but that are considered energy jobs. There are going to be energy jobs that are cleaner, um, about reducing emissions, that are, you're going to be an employee. Those people are going to be employees of traditional energy companies that you wouldn't think of, and making sure that we're creating ladders of opportunity and investment to enter into those segments. Um, I kind of like to think of the cleaner future almost like the tech boom. We didn't know what we didn't know in the careers and the opportunities that you'd have in technology and how important it is into our daily lives now. Investing in cleaner jobs is going to be like that tech job where we won't even know how to live without it and we don't even know the future of it. Um, and we're continuing to invest um, in, in the new workforce to achieve that goal. Yeah, I think, um, you know, from my perspective, which is not as somebody who works in the industry itself, but the success story and the success stories are in this room, right? And they are the work that we do every single day, not only when we are looking at the kinds of federal policy that are being passed that would enable um, more equitable, clean energy jobs to exist, but all the way down to the local level, right? Look at those bills in your um, in the cities where you live, what are your city council people supporting? Are there opportunities there for local folks to find clean energy jobs? Is the city, is the state um, creating new clean energy programs, workforces, opportunities, investments, right? All the way down from like the neighborhood that you live in up to what is your senator who you're not really sure what their job is but seems cool what are they doing right and and are they creating opportunity there for folks to find those jobs to get um, the education the pathways the knowledge that they need um, to be um, able to enter those clean energy industries and then what are the companies in our communities doing to support the success of those same people? Um, I think that's a question we have to ask ourselves um, every single day. Um, what, what's being done? How are we changing the system? And how are we making the system better? Um, and so that we can continue to have um, more and more success stories. Thank you. I think that's a great note to end on um, because I think something Alex said is that, you know, not only do we need representation, but we also need folks who really embody the values that we're talking about and who want to make progress on this issue. And I will just volunteer all of us on this stage. I think all of us want to be allies in that effort. And so um, very much invite any of you in the audience to reach out to us. Um, I think we want to we want to help help address this issue in a very meaningful way in our own lives and our own work. So definitely want to be um, of service to you all um, as, as we try to do that. I think uh, we talked about a lot of important issues here. We recognize that this is a systemic issue that's gonna take a long time to make progress on, but we want to do the work and we want to do the work now. Um, so with that, I just wanna thank our great panelists for this really thoughtful discussion. Alex, Vaughn, Amy, Andrea, thank you so much for being willing to sit on the stage with me and share your thoughts on this really important topic. And thank you to the audience for your attention. Um, please keep tweeting about the conference at hashtag CHCIHHM22. <laughs> um, next up is a 30-minute networking break, followed by five concurrent breakout sessions from 10.30 to 11.30. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.